We've had the Lenovo Legion Go on our sites for a couple of weeks now, with its beautiful 8.8 inch QHD display powered by the Ryzen Z1 Extreme, innovative controls and whispers of a repairable design, we genuinely thought that the Steam Deck may have finally met its match. Then out of nowhere Valve released an upgraded Steam Deck with an OLED panel, a new 6 nanometer processor and a bunch of repairability upgrades. We couldn't resist. We might have two repairability heavyweights in the teardown lab and we're going to pit them against each other to see who's more likely to walk away after a good beating. Before we get into the teardown, we need to disclose that we provide repairability solutions to both Lenovo and Valve. That's handled by a separate team, and here on Editorial, we went out and bought our own Legion Go. We did get one of the new Steam Decks a little early from Valve, but to ensure that the hardware hasn't changed, we went out and bought our own anyway. And no, Valve did not try to trick us. We're giving the Legion Go the first swing at winning the repairability prize, and it opens up with a strong flurry of accessible Phillips head screws. The back cover clips put up a bit of a fight, but come away easily enough. Something we noticed here, the frame has wonderful number one printed on it. I wonder if this means that a Philips number one is all you need. Let's try. I'm going to unplug the battery to make the device safe and have a good look inside. There's an easily accessible M.2 drive right out in front, so I'm going to nab that first. Not only can a damaged drive be easily replaced in the Legion Go, this placement gives you the option of upgrading your storage if you find you need more space down the line. The next component on my list is also the first thing that's likely to wear out in any lithium-powered device. That's right, I need to remove the battery. To do that, I need to get this plastic bracket off, and that means disconnecting a whole slew of antenna and speaker cables. That's not great to be honest, these cables are super annoying to pop back in place. With the bracket away, the pull tabs are pretty easy to prep for removal. There's only two pull tabs, and this is a pretty long battery, so yeah, we're gonna be here for a minute. The trick is to roll them up with a pair of flat tweezers and slowly pull away at a low angle but you have to be careful not to touch anything else. It's very satisfying, and as you can see, the battery is more than willing to pop out. Taking the speakers out also helps clear the space of this mess of cables and allows us access to the thermals. We're still using that Philips number one, by the way. This lonesome board is home to the headphone jack and a Realtek audio codec, which is connected to the main board via a ribbon cable. The LCD panel's cable swings around the board and is secured by a metal bracket. A few screws are all that hold the main board in place. With the main board out, we can take a closer look at what's on it. Front and center is the AMD Z1 Extreme APU on TSMC's N4 process. The N4 manufacturing line is actually based on TSMC's 5 nanometer node, the same as the ROG Ally. The smaller the node, the better the power savings and performance relative to the die size. By comparison, the LCD Steam Deck was on a 7 nanometer node. Our two 8GB LPDDR5X modules are soldered to the board. I prefer upgradable RAM, but there aren't any modular RAM packages that would fit in this form factor right now. Another interesting chip that has barely been mentioned since the last set of Lenovo gaming laptops were released, Lenovo's own LA1 AI chip. Lenovo claims that the LA1 can achieve up to 15% power efficiency by calculating the processor power requirements in real time. Alright, it's time to move on to the screen. It's definitely not the worst screen I've removed, and the glue comes away easily enough. Just watch for flex in the center of the frame as you lift the screen. Now onto the most innovative parts, the controllers. The left controller feels very light at 99 grams. Opening it up reveals quick and easy access to the battery, which plugs into the PCB with a simple connector. That's an excellent design. The right controller is a fair bit heavier at 114 grams and clearly contains more hardware. We have the same battery and connector combo, the scroll wheel, and various buttons and cables. All of this presents an intimidating sight for any would-be repair hero. I'm more interested in that mouse though, and right now all we know is that the sensors are located at the bottom of the controller. Modern mice come in two flavors, either optical or laser, and they both work roughly the same way. By illuminating a surface using an infrared light or a laser, which then bounces back into a CMOS sensor. By capturing changes in surface texture, it then calculates the change in movement from one position to another. Dave2D received a pre-production model, and his excellent review showed what's clearly a laser mouse, but ours definitely isn't emitting light in the visible spectrum. Taking a look under a microscope reveals what appears to be a surface mount IR emitter next to a CMOS sensor. This means that the production model controllers are either being shipped in two flavors, or more likely, at some point during the production process, Lenovo switched from laser to infrared. And we saved the best for last. 
you'll never guess what we found inside these low-profile thumbsticks. This is blowing my mind right now. This thing has Hall Effect sensors. This is the first time a major manufacturer has dropped those pesky potentiometer sticks in favor of Hall sensors. Very well played, Lenovo. The reigning champ of PC gaming handhelds is up next, but before we do our teardown, let's take a quick look at the evolution of the Steam Deck. It was early last year that Valve released the original LCD Steam Deck, and since then it's had a few minor revisions, up until two months ago when they released a major revision of the LCD Steam Deck, and it kind of slipped under the radar, not many people noticed. That second significant revision is worth mentioning because it happened so close to this new OLED release. I'm definitely getting the sense that this is a passion project and not just a product for Valve. Let's get to the teardown so we can do a proper side-by-side -side comparison. I've not even opened the back yet and I've spotted our first difference. Torque screws, T6 to be precise, have replaced the almighty Phillips screws that we found on the LCD models. Torx screws are definitely less common than Phillips screws, but they do have one major advantage over Phillips screws. They're less easy to strip. If you have one of our toolkits, you'll have the necessary bits to get into your Steam Deck, but there's no doubt about it, Phillips head drivers are more common in most households. With the back cover off, the very first repairability upgrade is visible. The screw pillars are now embedded with a metal thread, which means the back cover isn't screwed directly into plastic. Metal threads won't strip as easily as plastic threads. Now to make the device safe, let's disconnect the battery. Unlike the Legion Go, we don't have access to that M.2 drive just yet. We do however have immediate access to the thumbsticks where we can find yet another change. The bumper button has moved from the daughter board over to the thumbstick module. This was done in response to feedback from some deck owners that were dealing with difficult to repair bumper button damage. The thumbstick module is cheaper and easier to replace than the entire daughter board. This is definitely a clever and simple solution. What is inside that thumbstick though? The ALP stamp on the side is a big enough clue and sure enough I met with the same old potentiometer. The Legion Go definitely has the advantage there in longevity. Next up is the interconnect cable. Previous iterations of the deck tucked this cable under the mainboard, and in the first iteration especially, it was possible to pinch and cut that cable when reinstalling the heat shield. With the shield out of the way, we now have access to the M.2 drive which has been turned at full 90 degrees. That's probably for good reason. When performing read-write functions, the SSD may emit enough RF interference to mess with the nearby wireless module. So far so good, and note that we're still using our T6 bit. Also new in this revision, the daughter boards can be removed without touching the triggers. This is an excellent improvement for daughter board and touchpad repairs, since that's one less component you have to remove. With the thermal management system off, we can see how much has changed on these boards. The upgrade from Wi-Fi 5 to Wi-Fi 6E introduces a new chipset and an additional coax cable. Removing the board gives us a closer look at the APU. Based on AMD's Zen 2 architecture, the new Sephiroth APU is on a 6 nanometer node, improved from the 7 nanometer process the LCD models use. As Gamers Nexus's excellent teardown pointed out, the board has been heavily optimized to reduce the overall number of components, which simplifies the production process. One thing that wasn't optimized, though, the micro SD expansion slot. Be sure to remove your SD card before dismantling your deck and avoid shearing your card in two. I'm finally at the battery, something I've intentionally left for last because the removal process is still quite difficult. The latest revisions of the Steam Deck have done away with large adhesive pads and the battery is now secured by four strips. This makes the removal process a bit easier, but it's still not pleasant. We normally like to use isopropyl alcohol to loosen adhesive pads like this, but you shouldn't do that with the Steam Deck. The subframe has lots of holes cut into the battery well and the alcohol could seep through and damage the screen. But sometimes you have to do it, especially if you're in a hurry. Let's take a look at that battery. With the space gained from shifting to a thin OLED panel, Valve was able to bump up to a 50 watt hour battery, a 25% size increase over the 40 watt hour battery. Once the battery is out, removing the screen is fairly straightforward. The adhesive around the edges is relatively light. With the deck apart, let's take a closer look at all the hardware changes. The OLED panel isn't backward compatible, so you can't just upgrade your LCD deck. There's a good reason for that though, a lot has changed internally to make this new screen work. The LCD mainboard doesn't have the necessary chipsets to interface with the OLED screen. It's simply not possible to do a straight swap. Our chip ID linked in the description goes into exhaustive detail on all the parts that have changed. The touchpads have changed too. 
Valve's engineers redesigned the metal frame of the pad to be more durable, but as a result, the old pad doesn't fit in the new chassis. The capacitive touchboard PCB does fit, but the two parts are not interchangeable. The new touchboard has a 6-pin connector, whereas the old one had a 4-pin connector. The speakers appear to be unchanged, and I didn't have any trouble swapping these parts between devices. Thermal management is always top of mind for Valve, and in the latest LCD revision they flipped the fan over. The OLED model keeps this design and the fan on the latest LCD revision is compatible with this new OLED Steam Deck, although the screw placement on the copper heat pipe has shifted slightly. So can you upgrade the old LCD Steam Deck with the new 50 watt hour battery? Well, you can certainly put the 40 watt hour battery in the new OLED deck, but you can't go the other way around. The 50 watt hour battery is just slightly too thick for the LCD Steam Deck. With our marathon teardown of the Lenovo Legion Go and the Valve Steam Deck OLED complete, we can say with absolute certainty that both manufacturers incorporated repair early in the design process for these devices, but that doesn't mean that each device doesn't have room to improve. The Legion Go provides us with drift-proof hall sensor sticks and pull tabs under the battery for an easy and pain-free repair experience. Where it falls short is in overall complexity in the controllers and components and cable placement within the device. Now of course, Valve has been a trendsetter by designing for DIY repair, offering OEM parts and manuals through iFixit right from the get-go. They continue this tradition of repairability by revising the LCD models and addressing some major faults like the bumper buttons and the interconnect cables failing. Where the Steam Deck continues to fall short, however, is in the battery removal process, which is still a huge pain, and the micro SD slot is still on the wrong half of the outer shell. Overall, both devices present a DIY repair-friendly approach to their construction, and both have publicly available repair manuals. But where Valve pulls ahead of Lenovo is in the availability of OEM replacement parts. Bearing in mind these factors, we've given the Steam Deck a provisional score of 9 out of 10, while the Legion Go receives a provisional score of 8 out of 10. The Legion Go score would improve further if Lenovo decides to provide OEM replacement parts to the general public, as they generally do with their laptops. All in all, these are both really solid machines. It's a great time to be a mobile gamer.